Imagine having access to a tribe of mentors consisting of some of the best tech leaders in the world, people you may have never heard of, but who in just an hour, you'll know their unfiltered career story, the bets they took, the decisions they made, where they failed, and the lessons that they learned along the way. Welcome to the What Makes You Tick podcast. Hello there. I'm Tolu, aka The Podfather, and I'm the host of What Makes You Tick. Hello, Tolu Podfather. It's wonderful to have you as our host on this podcast. You bring these episodes to life, and I know that people are going to enjoy this conversation greatly, particularly because this is a good friend of mine, someone that I've only met very recently, but we've got a wonderful relationship. She's part of the SDR Leaders of EMEA community, is a really strong voice within that community, and has worked with some really interesting companies at the kind of forefront of psychology, sales, marketing, and go-to-market. So I think there's a huge amount of value in this conversation. Her name is Marina Tolu. Tell us a bit more about this week's guest. Thank you. And for those of you who don't know, that was Richard Washington, the co the founder and the owner of Tech Talent, and he is the mastermind behind this podcast. Uh, absolute nonsense, Tolly. Absolute nonsense. You're the mastermind. No, no, um, no, 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 no. I'm your underling. I am just the underling. <laughs> <laughs> you are the mastermind genius behind this podcast. Well, let's agree that our, our guests are the stars, and certainly Marina is Absolutely. this week. So tell us a bit more about Marina. Marina is was just fascinating, really, really interesting. She's a very like deep thinker. So like we have a really, really good conversation. Mm -hmm. And there's almost this battle as well for her between kind of trying to understand how to really express herself in a way that people can also engage with because she's really, really mm -hmm. honest, like, but in a really kind way, but in some environments that's actually not welcome. So we have a really interesting conversation mm -hmm. about that kind of that battle. How does that work? Some of it is also cultural as well. Cause you know, in English culture, like we love the stiff upper lip and kind of keep calm and carry on. But it's like, everything is burning to crap. Like we need to do something, but sometimes as English people, we don't really engage with that. So yeah, really, really mm -hmm. interesting conversation, but she, she's a great leader. And the way she approaches yeah. things, the way she looks after her team, the way she develops her team is just, yeah, just something to really be admired. So I, I really enjoy talking to Marina. Yeah, absolutely. And she's got a fascinating career story, right? Starting as like an IC within finance, yeah. selling, you know, to really senior people, then pivoting into sales development world, really at the start of that kind of industry trend, mm -hmm. and then working for some of the biggest companies within sort of social selling managing teams of 30 people and turning around performance and building things from scratch. She just mm. understands this part of the market to such a high degree. Mm. Um, and like you say, it's just such a deep thing because every time that we communicate and have a conversation, we both come away like we've learned something. And I think they're mm. some of the best relationships that you can have. So I know people are going to get a lot from this episode. There's a lot of value that she's, she can, she's going to share with you. And so much uh, of an interesting story that people will be able to take some nuggets from in terms of their own path and future decision, decisions, mm. as mm. well as some inspiration around maybe some challenges that they're facing and how she overcame them. So without further ado, let's roll the VT. Marina, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. It's an honor to have you on. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here and I can't wait to kickstart. Me too. What makes you tick, Marina? In the SDR leadership play, what makes me tick is, and please don't put me down as somebody who um, is as predictive as you possibly can be, but it's actually true. And this is when, you know, you reach a stage in, in, in your experience when you can give out much more and you can contribute much more as in a leadership position than if you would be an individual contributor. And once you hit that stage and you learn, so basically there is no, there is no book manual, there is no ABCs for SDR leadership whatsoever. So you have to figure things out. And the thing that keeps me going, the thing that keeps me ticking and what makes me tick and makes me want to come back no matter how hard things is is simply seeing other people succeed whether it's on a higher level whether it comes to their promotions or small things like for example you do a session 40 minutes later the person slays their dragon or books a meeting hmm. right or hmm. their script starts suddenly working 
or they overcome their fear of getting on the phone, little things matter. And this is what makes me tick. There is one more thing. Um, you know the dashboards on Salesforce or whatever CRM you're using? You know your report on PipeGen? Mm. This is my second one. <laughs> what is it about that? Essentially, so I think of myself as a pipeline generator first and okay. as your leader second. Pipeline generation always, always comes first. And as your leadership is the tool or the way that I'm doing it. Mm. And if we go back to what you said about watching people succeed, what's one of your favorite memories or stories about watching someone succeed? I've managed a number of teams over the past few years. And what's really cool is that, A, I get to stay in touch with people and people come back for advice and for mentorship coaching, large or small, they come back, they reach out to me. Uh, the fact that they do is, like, I should be keeping a score somewhere on the wall. Uh, second, seeing them progress in their new roles. For example, mm -hmm. last year I had a person promoted to the AE role, and they're now one of the top performing AEs. Huh. Um, didn't take them very long either. You know, when the person comes in with all the skills, with all the prep, with all the knowledge, you know, and now it's about execution. Um, yeah, I'd say that's pretty much sums it up. Okay. And how did you get into sales? How did you start? So this is my second career before I was in banking and finance. As much as a spreadsheet makes a woman happy... <laughs> staring all day into either spreadsheets or when I was in the training floor into one of the eight screens that I had is fairly limiting. So although I'm an introvert, I do crave exposure to other human beings. And I find that, that this is basically where I get my juice. This is where I get my joy. So I thought, oh, I need to go and work on the client side. So I did do that to an extent in the financial world, but the cycle was very, very slow. So you might see somebody like twice a month, right? You might have some exposure to clients about twice a month, but that wasn't enough. So by accident, I had a coffee with my professor uh, who said, oh, Marina, I'm actually mentoring some people from this tech company uh, their use base is actually in finance and they're actually looking for somebody like you. Can I introduce you? I had no idea what I'm getting into at this stage. <laughs> but essentially that was that. Uh, it took me some time to figure out how SaaS works, how this, uh, how the whole structure of the organization works, how it is, how everything is connected. And then when everything clicked into place, I could piece all of my experience from other areas and put it all into the right. same bucket. Was that a tough transition or quite a quick transition for you moving from, from banking into sales? Tough in what sense? Like were you good at sales from the beginning or did it take you some time to really find your groove? So once you understood everything, was it like started hitting quota or did it take you a bit of time, like a few years before you really started to get into your rhythm? Got it. So um, what I was making mistakes on initially was not understanding or didn't really, I didn't really appreciate initially like how important it is, for example, to keep my CRM clean, right? It took me a few months to actually really get in and really understand the full cycle of it and how it's all combined. Um, the sales side was never really a problem. I could, for example, I would make the revenue, I would make the total number, but I, for example, I didn't get to the number of deals. So it over exceed the quota in dollars, but not in the number of deals, you know? And I thought, what was the point? You know, <laughs> like, what's, what's the big deal? <laughs> We're still, we're still making money. We're, we're making, we're like above quota. Everybody's happy. I'm paid lots of money. Like what's, mm. what's, what's the point? But now if I would speak to myself 
whatever it is, like 10 years ago, it's lit literally a very simple matter of sitting down and explaining how it works instead of expecting the person to run around and do the Lego building on their own. Uh, mm. So now, for example, I don't let people run around when they join. And three months, you know, when they join, three months, six months down the line, I sit down with them and we go through how it all works, how it's all interconnected, who is who. And, you know, there is the official org and then there is the unofficial org. And we go through that as well. Hmm. Can you explain for me the difference for you between the official and the unofficial? Um, people in tech wear a lot of hats. And their title hmm. does not necessarily always correspond to what they do. So um, that is obviously true in smaller companies and seed and uh, series A, et cetera, et cetera. But even in larger companies, you have to see beyond who is the official, uh, who is the official decision maker, but who is the actual decision maker. You need to know your own organization as well as the account that you're targeting or even better because who is the stakeholder if you are, for example, running some kind of project, how is it going to affect your team? Not only uh, not uh, the team, not your immediate team, but team in the vicinity. Um, sometimes people have titles, but you know that the person who reports into them is the actual decision maker. So you need to keep things very balanced and um, be a little bit mature about it and respect the fact that not everything is available on an org chart. What are some of the, the ways that you found effective in finding out who the real decision maker is? Like what are some of the questions that have been really good to ask or what are some of the methods that you've used to understand who's really going to make the decision? The way that I do it normally is, for example, if I have an idea, I'm not only going to go and sell it to the official decision maker. I'm going to first, I'm going to start at the lower level and I'm going to speak and sell to a bunch of people. I'm going to get their feedback. I'm going to get their, uh, incorporate any feedback that I get. For example, I don't know, maybe I've missed something, you know, they're very welcome to contribute. Uh, I'll gauge their appetite. Then I'm going to go level up, do the same thing. By the time I'm on the second, third level, the decision maker would have heard about my idea from other people. And because I use different language for different people, I would normally know who was the person, yeah. or you can just ask, who was the person basically who with whom the idea resonated so much that they decided to go and sort of pre-pitch for me. Um mm. That's one way of doing this. Another way is simply speaking to people. You can find out. Okay, so, okay, so I've been introduced to the company. I know who is who on paper, but, okay, tell me, who is actually, you know, who is who? What kind of person is this person? How do I best communicate with this person? Are they a visual person? Are they a person who I have to, like, pick up the old fashioned phone and dial like what's the best way that I can actually connect with an individual. And you'll quickly understand who is who you've got a mind map yeah. and um, that's pretty much it in terms of specific questions. Oh my God, that is so personalized. We almost need to pull up like a LinkedIn profile and <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay. And when did you start leading people in sales? Oh my God. I've never asked myself that question. <laughs> Five, six years ago. Okay. Okay. And had you been leading people when you were in banking and finance before that or no? Oh no. Oh no. I was a complete green monster. Literally fell out of university, you know, green monster. <laughs> it's like a green plant. <laughs> Green monster plant, uh, very hungry, very silly, very naive, you know, all that stuff. Okay. Okay. So what was it like when you started to lead people? 
it felt good. Um, it felt okay. good, you know, like I finally, I said, oh, this is very nice. You know, I get to, I get to do this. I get to like, look, uh, you know, before, you know, you, you, you help your peers, you do this, you do that. But now it was like, I get to do this. Like, and that's my real job that mm. like, I'm getting paid for this. This is amazing. You know, before mm. you kind of do it here and there. But now it's all about how do you scale this? How do you make sure that mm. it fits uh, with different personalities? So I was I was super happy. Okay. And what were some of the things that you had to grow in when you started to, to lead people? Well, the first thing that you need to learn is how to communicate both up and down and sideways as well. Again, there's nobody teaching you. There is no blueprint. Mm. And it didn't even occur to me before that that there is a difference in communication. There is a difference in communication here, here, and to the side. So I would say that was a, oh, I mean, it's obvious now, but back then it wasn't. If you had to summarize the differences between up, down, well, up, down, and across, how would you say you communicate differently with those different stakeholder groups? Uh, it really depends on, so, okay, so I'll start with up and across. So, um, mm. you always need to start with, for, for example, you, when you communicate to your boss and the way that you structure your whole work sort of motion is what does my boss need? Right. Um, and you almost need to be like an investigative, jo an investigative journalist sometimes because, we all want pipeline. We all want, you know, 120% at least on our quota. And we all want that. But what else? It's never really the real answer, right? So there is always going to be something that's like two or three things that are most important for that person in this month, you know? And I need to be there thinking, okay, what do I need to do to make that happen? How do I make sure that... I make my boss successful. Doesn't mean that I need to, you know, focus on this or do I need to, you know, scale it down? Do I need to give them more breathing space and step away and just, you know, sort of speak up when I'm asked to? Or shall I be more proactive? It really, really depends and I really need to adapt to that person. Mm. Um, at the same time, I also need to be made aware of what their boss needs and wants as well, what's efficient, what's not efficient. I need to sort of cross-check and reference and to make sure that we are all in alignment. With peers, it's uh, very simple. It's literally asking yourself a question, how can I serve? How can I serve my colleagues in X? How can I be helpful? Uh, if I have a quick solution that's going to save them lots of time, have it. I'll help. No problem. Um, managing downwards is a slightly different story. So there is a level of communication that is official, non-negotiable. And then I break it down and sort of personalize it per person and sell them the idea one-to-one -one. so again it's very much about sales and you mentioned that there was no blueprint were there any people that helped you um as you grew as a leader oh my god of course the people i met who helped me who held my hand when i most needed it are everything i owe them pretty much everything for hmm. example and i am going to name names my former boss, Engo, that was pretty much the first time when I worked together with a senior as DR leadership. I uh, was mm. absolutely dedicated to two-hour play. And, okay, so he's a pro in everything, you know, technical. But as a person, what is really, what was, what was absolutely amazing about him was that he had no ego. Yes, he's super senior, mm. But he's got no ego. He was very willing to learn. He was very willing to listen to opinions. He would override when necessary. And he would did it with such grace. 
um, that, you know, yeah. I watched him as close as I possibly could, how he nego how he communicated to the rest of the team, how he communicated up, how he was working with other departments. And um, I mean, needless to say, we're still in touch. I still run to him yeah. like, Ingo, <laughs> help, <laughs> I'm stuck, you know. Um, there were also a whole number of people that I met, whether it's, uh, for example, senior AEs, junior AEs sometimes. Mm -hmm. There is plenty to learn there. Um, there is senior leadership as well. You get exposure. You take what you like. You leave on the table what you don't like. Apart from that, the uh, um, community that we have now is just absolutely priceless. The SDR leaders of EMEA. So before yeah. I felt like, okay, I've got maybe maximum like four people that I can go to for advice. And I really need to sort of, you know, justify that time. Now it's on Slack. How cool yeah. is that? So there you go. Big shout out to David Wilkins. David Wilkins, ex-podcast alumni as well. So yeah, we love what he's doing with, with sales leaders of EMEA. Sorry, SDR leaders of EMEA got that wrong. But yeah, we, we absolutely love the way he's building and bringing together community all across Europe. It's, it's absolutely amazing. What are some of the other lessons that you, you took from some of those great leaders? If you don't, if you snooze on self-development, even if it's for six months, you're about three years behind. That's just how the industry works. So when some kind of, when you are in a tech role, sales tech role, and then as the R reaches out with you with a cold call or something, take that call. What's going to happen? Mm. If it's relevant to your business, take that call. Worst that's going to happen is you're going to learn something. Might not be necessarily a good fit for your business. You might not have budget, but for your own development, it is important to know what's out there. Yes, that's one channel, but also there is also the full stack of different resources, podcasts, articles, newsletters. Read them. It's your job. What are some of the things that you wish you did a bit differently as you came in sales and grew in leadership? I was quite lucky with companies mostly where I could be myself. I'm, I understand that I'm not everybody's cup of tea. Not everybody likes radical candor. Some people probably think that I come across a bit too, too honest and too straightforward, and it's not always appropriate. And I'm, I still have this dilemma whether to lean into that quality or whether I should learn to tame it and be normal. So if I'm talking about regrets, basically it's, it's a constant, it's not really a regret, but rather like a constant internal dialogue. Shall I be myself or shall I be normal? What does normal really mean though? Well, the differences are cultural. So for example, in the UK, people tend to be very politically correct. Um, mm. Difficult topics are usually swept under the carpet. We enjoy small talk, uh, usually about the weather. And, you know, even if sometimes I see that when things are crumbling, we sort of put this poster on, keep calm and carry on, and then yeah, keep yeah. on marching when, yes. you know, everything is just blowing up behind you and you're just waiting until it hits you too. So sometimes I, mm. there is a lot of good stuff in that, but sometimes I just want to stop everything and say, guys, hold on. Let's just look under the carpet and see what's happening there. Let's just get it sorted mm. and move on. You know, um, and God forbid you ask me about the weather. I'm sick and tired to talk about the weather. <laughs> so that's just one example of being normal. 
I think I think you're right. It is definitely very cultural. I think that deep down, though, I think a lot of people like radical candor because there's no games that are played. Like you understand exactly what's going on. I think that where it's really, really successful is when you can mix radical candor with kindness as well, because I think that sometimes people take radical candor as an excuse to be a bit of an ass about stuff and just blow up exactly how you feel. But I think that when radical candor can be mixed with kindness as well, and everybody understands, look, I'm telling you this because I don't want what's under the rug to trip us up. We need to look under the rug and clean what's under there, not just continue. I don't want everything to blow up because we're not addressing it. So I think that it's it's such an interesting balance um, with how do you express that? And so, so for example, I'm six foot six, so I'm like 198, right? So I'm quite a tall person. So while it's, while it's great, it comes with some other elements where sometimes that can be intimidating for people, right? Sometimes people don't necessarily like that. So I've had to understand for myself, how do I still bring that radical candor? How do I still have those tough conversations, but in a way that people still feel comfortable because it can be quite uncomfortable for people. So I understand a little bit about what you're saying with that in a dialogue, but for slightly different reasons. Yes. Intent needs to be specified sometimes bluntly. <laughs> exactly that. Exactly that. But you you seem like a very kind and quite gentle person from from our conversation. So I think that the radical candor will generally be quite well received. It's just also finding the right environment because in some environments, radical candor is not welcome. But longer term, those environments don't really succeed because you actually need that radical candor to be really, really successful and to be elite at what you do. Awesome. I had a funny conversation about perceptions with my... Um, with one of my bosses and mm. it was exactly the kind of situation where uh, in a cultural environment, my radical candor was not very well received. And um, my boss did actually something very interesting. It says, Marina, so here's a coaching opportunity. Next time do X, Y, and Z, right? Um, and I said, but hold on a second. You only got one side of the story. How about my side? He goes, good point. Mm. So I give them my side of the story. And he goes, oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> right. Okay. So we had a funny chat about it. You know, it's completely sort of the situation was completely diffused and everything. But what really strikes me is that I said at the end, I don't understand why they're so scared of me. You know, I'm nice and fluffy. And he goes, you nice and fluffy? Oh, no, no, you mother of dragons. You're not nice and fluffy. I'm like, but you know me. He's like, I know you, but they don't. And you come across as... Ugh. So... Really? Apparently. But, you know, I think I'm nice and fluffy. So... I mean, I can be a bit of a dragon, but... I thought you were nice and fluffy, too. Oh, thank you. Actually, no, not yeah. thank you. I want to be both. <laughs> you can be both. You can be both. Um, but yeah, I, I, didn't, I wasn't scared of you when we started talking, so... Well, that would make me a very, very bad person if I scared you at the initial chat. Yeah, <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. So... As you have been progressing in your career, what does success look like for you now? On a personal level and on sort of the things I want to do before I retire, um, there are two different sort of streams. On a personal level, I'm very, very happy to do what I do. I love it. Uh, sometimes people ask me, what's your hobby? What are your hobbies? I'm like, I don't need hobbies hold that many hobbies like I do what I love and I get paid for it I'm happy you know mm. um, yes I do want to go and go for my walks and I play Lego with my kid and everything and that kind of falls into the hobby bucket so to me being happy doing what I'm doing progressing being seen and getting paid for it that's cool mm. that's success uh, success from there are a bunch of things that I want to do 
in the future. And that's, for example, I want to be part of, uh, for example, a company where we are going towards an IPO. And I'm not talking, uh, I'm not only talking about a situation where, yes, it's very prestigious. You know, back in the days, that was the highest badge of honor to take our comp company public. But what I see is there's a lot of companies and the operational processes are not as well, well sharpened as they should be. And I personally think that no matter whether you're planning to go public or not, you want to be at that level of operational excellence mm -hmm. that if you have to, you can just go and apply tomorrow instead of doing it all in reverse and, you know, trying to rebuild something. Um, so that would be really, really cool. Also, being part of a company that is growing. Uh, yeah. Yes, I know it's a cliche, but not in the last three years. The story in the last three years is how much can you, how far can you go on a shoestring budget? Like, for example, last year I had to do a quota for, with 10 people, and the quota was the same as bef when before my team was cut and we were an org of 32 people. Wow. So that's a skill as well. I think doing more with less is, yeah, doing more with less is a quite a big thing at the moment. Yeah, I've been there, done that. I've been doing it for hmm. well, about four years, doing more with less, you know. I'll be very honest with you. At some point, you get, you get tired. So I would love, I would absolutely love to be in a situation where we're growing. And I would not be taking it for granted at all. Um, and to be honest, it's probably like back in the days, I thought, you know what? I'm going to stick. I'm going to carry my team and I'm going to do what needs to be done. Because everybody can do. Everybody in their dog can succeed in a, grow, in a growing company. You know, that's just how it works. But how many people can actually succeed when there's barely anything? What can you do out of nothing? What can you contribute? Can you, like, carry on? Can you keep the spirit? Can you keep your team spirit? So, yeah, I've done a lot of that. I want growth. Hmm. <laughs> what, what's been successful for you in being able to do less with more? Because like you said, you've, you've kind of carried that quota when, you know, your team's been slashed. What has been, how have you been able to do that? Uh, first of all, it's a lot of therapy with individual contributors. Second, um, and basically we're talking about first therapy, then motivational conversations, um, figuring out exactly what motivates each individual on a personal basis, not only professional basis, and leaning into that every time I need to sell them something. Second, prioritizing individual control basically in um, prioritizing people as they come as people as opposed to for example spending the budget on something fun right so for example when i had i was at some point i was given budget for a low numbers a few k right that budget basically was given to me for some kind of team get together right mind you my team is <laughs> spread across three continents and they would probably I thought mm, maybe I can get them in but they will have to stay in my house you know and um, so instead I thought you know what that is not a good uh, way to spend money um, what I did instead was I promoted two of my people to team leads and got them a pay increase where when nobody was getting any kind of pay increases. Um, I was very transparent with my team about this because they need to know why we're not doing a fun dinner. Um, mm. And um, although we didn't get a fun dinner or a sort of uh, get together, uh, I think people valued it much more because they saw that I have a bit of a common sense about it.
how did that conversation go down? Like, what was that? How did you do that? How did that happen? How was it received? Uh, with my senior management or with my team? Oh, both. It was a very short conversation with my senior management. It was, I think, if I quote properly, um, I think the phrase was, well, I knew you would do that. This is something I'd expect from you. Like, okay. Cool. <laughs> That's awesome. Whatever that means. Cool. And with my team, it was, to be honest, it was a similar sentiment. Like, okay, so first of all, logistically, we could have done something sort of um, uh, differently. But I honestly did not have any problem selling them the idea that we're going to have uh, two people are going to get a raise instead of us having a nice dinner. It's like it was a no-brainer. But then my team is also quite mature and uh, they are a bunch of really smart young people. So so you mentioned just now that both your senior management team and your um, the team that you managed or lead, they were both not surprised that that's something that you would do. If you could describe in a few words what, how do you want people to feel about you or your leadership? How would you want them to describe your leadership? What would those words be? Can I give you a slightly silly visual example? Sure. So imagine you have a stable of very nice sports cars and they come in different breeds and flavors, right? And this is my people. My job is to know them inside out and service them as fast as I possibly can to make sure our pipe gen keeps pouring in. So essentially, you are managing a stable of sports cars and making sure that they are at their best performance. So, yeah, pretty much somewhere between a servant leader and a mechanic. I've never heard that before, but that is very cool. So one of our closing traditions is that we do what we call tick fire questions. So I ask you some questions in quick succession. Are you ready for your tick fire round? Let's do it. So the first question is, what is your favorite go-to interview question or questions and why? My favorite, inter okay, my favorite interview question is like when people introduce themselves or something and do this whole prepared spiel, I go back and ask, okay, and what are you actually like as a person? Oh. So there is there is the sort of a very nice persona that we bring into interviews that is comprised in a bunch of books. Mm. We've read them all. We know them all. And I'm like, okay, so this is very nice. But what are you actually like, like a person? And yeah. that is that, that tends to produce quite interesting results. Very interesting. I love that question. If you were going to host a podcast about whatever you like, who would be your first guest? Oh, man, narrow down the scope. There are so many interesting people out there. Um, oh, again, a cliche, but I'm going to have to say Simon Sinek. Um, I really love what he is, the way that he thinks about things. And I love the fact that he's so uh, honest about being an introvert. I'm one as well. And there are still people out there who are naturally, so who just generally assume that, you know, to do what we do, you need to be this happy-go-lucky um, extrovert and stuff like that. But frankly speaking, 80% of what I do is based on listening skills not on talking skills. I like that. Okay. And then leaders who are going to thrive in the next five years, what will they be good at? Emotional intelligence, um, continuous, constant self-development. And I'm not talking about go the core to the courses that your organization assigns you, but what are you doing proactively to educate yourself? People who are good listeners. The tide has changed. <laughs> what does emotional intelligence mean to you? Self-awareness and empathy to other people. When you start any communication, any kind of any engagement, 
with whether it's an organization or an individual with putting them first. Like, how can I be useful to this person or this organization? What can I do, right? And what state are they in? What is happening in their world that I need to consider? I really like that definition. So I had an emotional intelligence podcast. So I've heard lots of definitions from emotional intelligence. And that's a good one. That's a good one. Um, my last question for you is, if you could go back to the start of your career with everything that you know now, what would you do? Uh, try a lot of different things. Don't go after things which your parents thought were high status uh, or this is what you're supposed to do. Uh, no, try a lot of different things. Reflect on what is it that brings you joy because if you find joy in what you're doing, success will come. So if I would speak to myself 20 years ago, I'd say, okay, it's okay not to work in banking just because your parents want to. It's perfectly fine to go and do something else. Awesome. Marina, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I've really enjoyed our conversation. And I know lots of other people will too. So thank you so much. My pleasure. <laughs> thank you, Tolo. Come again anytime. Thank you for listening to another episode of What Makes You Tick. I hope that you enjoyed listening as much as I enjoyed having the conversation. Absolutely. There's so much value in learning from virtual mentors, people that have already gone through incredible careers and they've got wonderful stories and lessons that they can share for you to have a bigger and better career in tech. And if you like this sort of content, we've also got a newsletter that we publish weekly called Growth Magnet, all about tech startups, leadership, scaling and performance. We'll put a link in the show notes and it'll be fantastic to see your comments on our next post. Thank <laughs> you.